Welcome to Archetypes. I'm Lee Woodruff, and I'm here with Harry Allen, who is an industrial and interior designer. Did I get that right? You did. <laughs> well, you brought some of your objects today, so why don't we I'd love to hear you talk about them and how you came across them, what they are, how that evolution worked. Sure. I'm a, I'm a little bit of a chameleon. I'm not like the stylist who has one style and then someone comes to me and I stamp you know, my aesthetic on their product. I, I try to look at everything very individually and every project is like a new set of opportunities, a new set of nightmares. So I approach everyone very individual. So you'll see that each project is very different. Really, I mean, you've really gone all across the boards as we're about to see. This is a project that I did for uh, Johnson & Johnson. Um, I have a very good friend uh, who became the art director. And this was one of the first projects that came across his desk. It was to redesign the first aid kit, which as an industrial designer is like a you know, gold mine. It's this. You know, it's, it's an icon, yeah. you know, you, and yeah. you have all that information in your head from when you were a kid and break, cut your finger or whatever. And, uh, and so we didn't, we didn't do much to it. it it's really just a, just a clamshell. We wanted it to have an iconic shape. And then also that having it stand up on end saves a lot of space in your cabinet. You don't have to stack things on top of it. But for that kind of design work, is he just saying, this is what I need? And you think space saving, you think you know, icon on the front. When you're designing, you're thinking about how things are being made, you're thinking about who's going to be buying it, you're thinking about the brand itself, you're thinking about what you consider good design. So there's all these different forces going on and that, that answer is in the middle somewhere. And this satisfied a lot of the criteria. It was the, the way it was made was, was right on. Um, you know, and it, it sort of gave this new message for them, this sort of streamlined, modern message. I love it. Thank you. What else you got? Well, I brought um, another piece of packaging. This is a, a project that I did for Marc Jacobs. This is a fragrance bottle. It's, it's his last men's fragrance to launch. It's a couple years old now. All I knew about this was who Marc Jacobs was. They gave me a, like an 80-page brief on who he was and what he did and his work. And I knew the name, Bang. And it needs to sort of... Uh, encapsulate all of that. So I went and I was just working in my studio and I thought, what bang, what can be bang? And I started working with metal and I had this, this rectangular hammer and I just took a piece of metal and I went bang. And then I took that piece <laughs> of metal, we fed it into the computer and we used that exact, I mean, that's the exact that's geometry it. That's of it. That's bang right there. Yeah, and then we used the back of it for the back of it. So it sort of pushes I out. I love it. Liked the fact that it sort of looked somewhere between a Frank Gehry building and a piece of bent metal that you would find on the street. And it's a pretty object in the end, and it sort of invites people to go, what's that, you know? It's another project where I did a lot of work for them, and of all of it, it was just sort of, the, it told the story in the purest way. How did you get into this field in the first place? My father was an engineer, and my mother was an art teacher. So there, like that, con like I, every day I see that confluence in my life between the two of them, sort of coming together in what I do. Sometimes I think design is not approachable for the rest of us. It's a scary thing. It's a high touch thing, and maybe we're not that creative. What would you say to the pedestrian about design? What they need to know about design? You know, I just feel like there's nothing in life that is very interesting unless you engage in it. It's like the art world, it's scary until you engage in it and you learn about it. And, but it's like any, any subject is sort of scary until you learn about it. And there's, there's not a lot of design education in the United States. Um, so it sort of is this other world. I mean, you go to Japan, people know my name in Japan. I'm actually a, like a, a player in Japan in the design world, but here in the United States, you know, no one would know who I was. Europe, they're much more design conscious. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but, but I think that's education, and, and I think it's about educating yourself. And what advice do you have for somebody who's got that creative sort of archetype inside of them and wants to take it and make it, you know, a place where they can have a living, do something useful? What would you tell someone coming up today? You know, it's, it's all about perseverance, and you just got to figure out how to keep going, you know, and you got to figure out... Um, you know, how to keep making things. You can't just keep making things and putting them in the closet. Like there has to be, if you're a designer, there has to be an end result to it. And the, the other thing is it's really easy to be a creative person. It's really easy to like have the idea, 
but actually seeing that idea to completion or finding the client or finding the money or finding all the components that, that make it become real, that's the hard part. You know, it's a lot like birth, you know, making the baby is the easy part. It's raising it and educating it and feeding it for the 18 years that you need to like make it come out uh, as a fully formed, you know, human. Um, same thing with design. It's the idea is easy, but making it happen is hard. And design in America, you sort of said the Europeans and the, the Japanese are way ahead of us, but where do you see us going with design in this country? I can't really tell you where I think it's actually going, but I can tell you where I would love for it to go. Less, better things. Fewer, better things. I find that there's just so much junk being sold. Like if you, and you can buy, you can go to the big box stores and you can just fill up your waist, your, your, your waist can, your, your, your push basket just with just like more stuff and it's cheap and it comes from China and it's just like, it's like, oh my God. Would you ever work for a big box client? Uh, yeah, I, I have. I have done work for Target and, uh, but it was good design for, for one of their uh, licensees. The flip side of the big box thing is that's the industrial design fantasy is you make, you, you give one object a good idea or a good form or you put thought into that object and then you can mass produce that object and give it to many, many people. And that was, that was sort of, you know, that was the 20th century idea of what industrial design was that, you know, it was, it was good design for the masses. And so, you know, I did this little lamp for Ikea. You know, there's Ikeas all over the world. There was probably one of those being sold, you know, every hour of every day all over the world. And I didn't get a lot of money for that, but I did it because I knew that it would fulfill that fantasy of sort of this mass distribution. So, so that, you know, that's attractive also. I mean, I can, you know, espouse the ills of, you know, big box <laughs> stores, but you know, at the end of the day, a client's a client's, and, and there's great things about that too. If you could, if as a designer, you could affect that world, you'd be doing everyone a service too. You could maybe make it a little bit better. You could make it last a little bit longer. You could make it something that, you know, people want to live with for a longer period of time. Well, Harry, thank you for being with us today. And thank you for watching Archetypes.